Hey everybody, so um, I wanted to do a short video and kind of give you a rundown on one of the things that's really commonly going to be a hurdle in raising boiga, um, and that is that oftentimes they simply just don't want rodents as food. Um, nothing you can do about that, it's biology. Uh, with that said, uh, short of raising zebra finches or society finches and pulling dale chicks for neonate uh, boiga, the next most viable option is to simply uh, force feed them mouse tails until they're <clears throat> large enough and old enough to accept rodents as prey, which some species can be as simple as a couple of mouse tails. Uh, for species like Multimaculata here, which are, that's an enclosure for a juvenile, they're very small, you know, you might be talking six, seven months of uh, giving them tails. Um, so that's something that I feel like needs to be addressed because the interest and popularity of this genus as viable captive bred, um, captive animals is growing, and I think that's something that just, it simply needs to be addressed. This isn't a conventional genus, this isn't a corn snake or a ball python. Um, they are advanced, and with that comes difficulties. And it doesn't mean that, um, it doesn't mean that you necessarily uh, need to work with boiga or, or not work with boiga. It just means that if you do decide to work with them, this is something you should be prepared to deal with. Um, because even if you do go out and you insist on the most started babies that only take frozen thought and they know their name and you know they act like little puppies for you, they're going to go on to produce babies for you. And if you haven't figured out how to properly work with boiga, well, those babies are in bad hands. So it's best for you to address these things early on and learn the skill set of how to properly raise them before um, you go out and you acquire them. So anyhow, we're gonna start with three common Boiga species to have to force feed. Um, first and foremost, we'll do uh, Boiga crepolini. Uh, there's two forms in captivity. Um, I have both forms. Uh, this is the Vietnamese type. And this is a juvenile female, uh, which we've had since, oh, I don't know, I want to say maybe March. And she's full of piss and vinegar, and you can see her flattening out her head. Um, she's actually growing tremendously. She's probably almost twice as big now as she was when I first brought her in. So what you want to do is just kind of gently recoil. And see, she tried to chew on me. Gently recoil the head back between your fingers. Pick an appropriately sized mouse tail, and you want to start a with a, a damped uh, mouse tail. If it's dry, you're asking for trouble. And the second part is, you want to try to cut the end uh, relatively evenly. Uh, if it's all frayed because you just plucked it off a, a frozen mouse, well, it's going to have trouble going down. Um, so make sure it's defrosted, make sure the end's cut evenly, make sure it's damp, and make sure you start with a thick end. So you're going to start thick end first. And you're just gonna kind of gently coax it into the throat. And I tend to just kind of rotate it as it goes down. And then once the majority of it's in, just kind of set the snake gently down. And now she wants to be my friend, so I'm an anchor for security. And that's that. So we're gonna move on. I'm going to set her to the side, keep an empty tub, just kind of cover her back up. And there's a water bowl in there that prevents that from completely squishing her. Next up is a Cyanea baby. Um, these go through a really dramatic ontogenetic color change, whereas a neonate, <clears throat> which is one here, um, this is an animal which just recently had its fresh first shed um, and refused its first meal. And because this genus has low fat reserves and a high metabolic rate, if they don't eat uh, with a steady frequency, uh, it does damage really quickly. Um, you can take a baby boa or baby ball python and just kind of wait them out for two or three weeks. And if they don't eat, they'll get hungry and they'll eat is the you know, prevailing wisdom. Uh, you don't have that luxury with boiga. Um, so they hatch, they don't eat. Well, they get about seven to ten days after their... Uh, they're shed from when they hatched, and they get a mouse tail. And that's just kind of the rhythm they stay on until they take their own meal on their own. And as these grow, um, their whole body will, will wind up with that bright green 
uh, with the black scalation behind it. They're uh, probably one of the most popular species in the genus. We kind of rearrange them a little bit. And again, find the lip, which he's very happily exposing. And just kind of get it back in the throat. Sometimes it takes a little bit of coaxing. Some of them are, especially one like this, this isn't, this is his first rodeo. He's very like, what are you shoving down my throat? We're gonna fight you a little, just work with it. The Crepolini's had numerous force feedings and she takes it a lot more willingly. And it's mostly down, unravel from the tail, gently place back in the tub. And you can see in the tubs what I do is I set a water bowl, there's a thin layer of paper towel, and then above that is just kind of a mashing of paper towel that's damp. I keep the paper damp all the time, spray about three times a week. Um, you might need to do more if your house is really dry, or you might need to do less if your house is, is really humid. Um, you just have to kind of play it by what works for you. If you're growing mold in your enclosures within 24 hours of a defecation before you got to it, that's too wet. Um, you're just gonna have to kind of figure it out for what works for your environment. Just gonna set him down over here. I'm making this up as I go as far as what I'm doing with these guys. This obviously isn't how I would normally do this. <clears throat> and then we have a little Multimaculata. These are tiny. These get about maybe the size of a corn snake full grown. Um, where are you? Not in its paper tumble. Yeah. And these, for for their tiny size, can be snotty little guys. Um, they're real stand their ground, uh, really small. I mean, Boiga salinensis is the only other Boiga I've had in this size range as a neonate. So you can tell he's ready to just chew on me. So, got me. <laughs> Don't let venomous snakes bite you. This is uh, totally not a dangerous animal. Um, so, Again, full mouse tail, I and mean, this is going to be a big meal, and he's very greedily starting because he thinks it's my finger again. And in spite of their small size, they can take a full mouse tail, you know, just obviously not a jumbo mouse. Down it goes. Paper back. I haven't cleaned him yet today, so he's got a little dampening. I'll have to clean him tomorrow since he just got fed. Tail back in, and you're a problem. Yeah, you're a little <laughs> rattlesnake, aren't you? All right. So that's that. Um, hopefully that helps. I know some of you have had trouble, um, and I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm some expert on Boiga. Um, I feel like I'm figuring this out as I'm going, as much as anybody. Um, this is. This is a genus which has historically kind of been squandered and treated like a cheap import that's disposable and it's only been over the past few years with the efforts of some really dedicated European breeders that were getting quality captive bred stuff you could start with, uh, which has been a big motivator for me to start working with this genus. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like some of these snakes are going to require um, some adaptation to what is our normal husbandry protocol for captive colubrids. Um, and as I learn, I'll happily share the information, but this is one of the big things that I've learned so far that I think needs to be shared and hopefully helps you. So thanks. Have a nice day.